Hey guys, what's going on? This is Ryan, also known as Cantering Clark. And I hope you all saw the video that I recently just posted on Twitter. All right, it's just a reminder that you should never get too comfortable. All right, so what I see lately is a lot of bears just kind of sitting back in their armchair, um, like they could more or less just sail off into the sunset with uh, an indefinite short on, with no mind for, you know, how the market can potentially change very quickly um, with no consideration to uh, first and foremost the next target that would likely um, serve as a um, decent point of contact for price to eventually come in contact with and that would be again testing the low which is actually from 2018 to the current uh, the macro point of control for both the 2018 structure and now the 2019 structure so we saw a good amount of absorption there initially all right, um, the end of November, um, and needless to say, you know, that is an area that when we approach again, if we do, um, that we can expect uh, would serve as some type of, um, to give some type of initial pause or, or pause in general to any type of movement, you know, that tries to pass through there. So I just want to remind um, anyone who is currently thinking about putting on a short or long swing or rather a longer duration short swing to keep this in mind okay you have to keep in mind uh, your next barrier right um, and what this looks like to me often is uh, you know when everyone starts getting bearish okay when the um, trade seems so obvious it seems to me that when everyone is aware of it more often than not in markets it's no longer really available so markets are from market to market, certain markets will be less efficient and more efficient. Um, cryptocurrency market is definitely a less efficient market, but nevertheless, when the masses are aware of something, more often than not, uh, the point of maximum opportunity is in the rear view at that point. So uh, let's just talk about um, the chart. Okay, it definitely is an ugly chart, but um, if we think about cycles, the more ugly it becomes, you know, inevitably we start to approach an area where it will likely find some balance. And again, bulls will have their day in the sun. All right. Regardless of whether Bitcoin hits an all time high in 2020 or 2021 or any time within the next few years, uh, it will not make a difference um, on the fact that it will not have a difference on the fact that uh, bulls will eventually again have their day in the sun and there will be a trend that many will be late to, uh, many will not believe initially, and then they will create that um, incredible momentum by eventually hopping on when they're comfortable enough to. And this pattern occurs, right? Um, over time, this this is what creates the cycles, all right? There's a initial lack of um, reflexiveness or responsiveness on the participants or by the participants. Um, there's that hurting behavior that eventually follows. And then finally, information is completely absorbed and you get that final push, which ends up becoming an exhaustive top, or if it's in the case of um, a move down, the exhaustive um, bottom. So this is um, very ugly, as I said. All right, we definitely have have broken higher time frame market structure in multiple ways. But uh, again, I just want to remind everyone that the higher time frame also includes all the time up until this point, which you cannot discount 2018. And what I mean by that is looking back at 2018 structure. All right, this was a key area for the majority. Okay, from um, February all the way till. Uh, the end of November when it finally broke down or the beginning of November when it finally broke down. All right. So although it did not provide any real resistance on the way up, uh, it definitely will serve as some type of psychological support, at least initially, um, if we are going to be making our way back down. All right. And we've already made decent progress going down. So anyone who's talking about the bear market like it's just beginning or if it just began um, has to be mindful that they're just absorbing information that was pretty obvious up here. Okay. Um, the major trend change occurred up here. So we had all the signs of a top, uh, and just because you relate to that party doesn't make it, um, doesn't mean that it's going to go continuing on, you know, just because you came late, right? So party might be over pretty soon, right? And that's the case with markets. You know, people end up late to the, to the move to the upside and to the downside, and then they get caught off sides, and they're what, they are what initially helps the market move in the opposite direction when they get trapped. Uh, anticipating further downside or if they're 
entering in um, on a par parabolic rise if they're anticipating further upside. And you'll see that futures being that, you know, markets are a zero-sum game, and in futures in particular, your long means that someone is betting the market will go down. Uh, the same emotions that are, are apparent on moves up and moves down, um, well, th there are the same emotions that are apparent on the moves up and on the moves down, and rather um, the outlook of things, okay? Um, you have to start paying attention to extreme changes in behavior, okay? Extreme changes in um, sentiment, all right? What I would say are standard deviations uh, above the norm. So um, when everyone is calling for, when it's back here and everyone is calling for 25K in a matter of a week, right? Or when we're over here and everyone is calling for 1K, all right? So, and they're not being mindful of all the other things that we'd have to go through, right? So bear with me. Uh, I have a little bit of the sniffles, okay? But um, so let's talk about the chart, okay? Let's talk about sentiment. Um, we'll go over some things with regards to funding and premium, all right? Uh, funding and premium, you know, we haven't had them for the duration of, of the crypto market because BitMEX has not been around the entire time, right? So we don't have a funding and premium chart to go off of um, going back pretty much beyond the first, you know, the last two years. Talk about the old fractals, okay? I want to touch on that. A lot of people like to reference old fractals. Um, I pretty much should probably just hit that really quickly. So there are times when, you know, there's a saying that the past does not repeat itself, but it does often rhyme, or history does not repeat itself, but it does often rhyme. So if we look back, you know, back to over here, you have a lot of people that are talking about this potentially looking like this. And I would just say as a caveat, you have to be careful because we're looking at a two-dimensional picture, right? We're looking at a two-dimensional chart, a screen with things that all look relatively similar. Okay, there is a fractal nature to markets, but it's very easy to look at one area of a chart at any time and to assume that it looks, even if it is remotely similar, that it is somewhat connected to a time in the past or right, or can have an influence on how things might unfold. All right, I just say to you know keep this in mind that your brain has that tendency towards um, seeing patterns where they don't exist. It was a survival mechanism in the past. Um, it kept you alive, but in markets, it does actually work to your detriment. So there's something called apophenia and periodolia, and you know, that's when you're seeing patterns and things that, that don't necessarily have any meaningful pattern or um, don't have a pattern to begin with. You're just connecting things rather loosely. So it's attractive because there are narratives, um, but I'd say that keep in mind as the market grows um, and the market will grow and it will go on for a long time. It's just the beginning of the market. It doesn't have to go into an all-time high in the near future, but it, the market will continue. Uh, there will be plenty of new patterns, okay? There will be plenty of new fractals, all right? Um, the market is so young that we can only anticipate and expect that everything that follows, um, there's a high probability likelihood of it being different. So that being said, okay, I have this bar chart on right now. It just keeps things rather clean, okay? I have a few things labeled on this, okay? The 2018 to current macro point of control, and then the 2019 to current macro point of control. And essentially what I'm doing with this is I am um, taking the volume profile uh, of the higher time frame macro structures, okay, and I'm identifying the areas where the highest amount of trading volume took place, okay? So uh, this is important because these were contested battlegrounds uh, in the past, and there's likely, whether or not it's dormant orders or traders looking to step in at these areas to defend them, okay, or sell them, um, because of the high transactional volume that occurred here in the past, we could assume that uh, there will be some responsiveness in the future. All right, so should we come in contact with these areas, we see that uh, even if you're not an order flow trader, you recognize that these areas do have some significance. So the 2019 to current, basically that's how it evolved over time. All right, and you'll see that this is the macro point of control, but keep this in mind as this unfolded, okay, this had changed. So the point of control was up here, it was down here, and now it's over here. So this is constantly evolving, but it's always good to keep these in mind, especially when you're talking about near-term support and resistance. And you can see right now, okay, we're between the 2018 current macro point of control, okay, which has been painted over quite some time, and the 2019, okay? And it looks like what we're doing is we're beginning to uh, create the same type of auctioning process that we had back here, where we are essentially ranging, with the exception of the fact that where we're currently ranging, and you know, I want to put this on the line really quickly just to give you a complete idea. Sometimes it's good to look at the line chart. Okay, we are definitely in a downtrend. Okay, we have a series of a lower high and a lower low. Okay, um, lower low, lower high, lower high. Okay, uh, beginning to have the spillover over here. But 
you know, this gives you the impression that it's what? Painting a high or low, right? So maybe a potential swing failure pattern below this, okay? Uh, obviously, you know, this could very well become another low very soon. Um, so it's really important that we don't just start, again, taking that idea and running with it, all right? We have to take price as it's unfolding, all right? We have to uh, play the ball as it lies, so to speak. So putting on the bar chart, or rather the candle chart, give you a more clear idea, okay? Uh, where basically it looks like we're beginning to do what we did back here, okay, where we had this high volume sell-off, okay, there's a lot of absorption down here at the lows, and then we are just creating these rotations within this structure. We had this fake out up here, and then we eventually broke down, okay, and I talked about the fake out, and I talked about the anatomy of a fake out uh, for Block Roots members. I talked about how the fact that you have to consider that throughout a range, okay, where are buyers going to be in fear, where are sellers going to be in fear, all right, once you're a buyer, you are a seller, and once you are a seller, you are a buyer. So if we're painting a range, for example, and I am long from the midpoint of the range, which is an area where a lot of traders get flat-footed, and price begins to pressure downwards, okay, then I am in fear. Any longs at that point could potentially be offsides, and their actions in the near term can dictate you know, the, the uh, eventual direction of price movement. So what happens up here is you get a fake out, and when you get a fake out, you trigger all these orders to not only buy, Okay, so if traders are looking to take advantage of the high breaking and they're looking to market buy in, so what happens when you create buyers up here? Well, you likely create stops at the lows. Okay, so either stops at the midpoint of the range okay, or stops at the lows if they are uh, higher time frames position and swing traders. So you have this fuel down here that's created in the midpoint of the structure. And then not only that, any trader that was looking to short this test okay, and that was blown through and ultimately had to close out their short, all right, so they're marketed out of their short up here, they're covering, okay, any profit taking order that they had left down here that would have been active and dormant, should their order still have been open, uh, think about an OCO order, um, that order would be lifted off the book at that point. So any type of resistance that would have been in the form of buying down here, okay, to cash out any short that was taken up here, that is immediately taken off. So what happens is mechanically you have all of this momentum built into the downside at this point. So once you have a fake out to the upside and you fall back within the range and then solve, start playing in the lower portion of it, um, and if we just take, uh, again, look at something like the fixed range profile for this rotation or series of rotations, what we'll see is that when you fall below here and you're basically um, grinding your way along the bottom of the range, there's a higher probability likelihood that eventually, you know, even with one of these fake outs upward to uh, test this area again, that you're going to actually spill through. So, you know, you could call this a deviation down here. Regardless of the fact, this is the type of situation that occurs uh, when you have these underlying effects taking place, or rather these underlying um, changes in order flow and just changes in uh, book, right? So the fact that shorts would have their take profits down here in the order, rather in the if they're in position and had not closed out, you built all that momentum up to the downside, sure, should price um, have tested this even lower and eventually, you know, uh, cause longs to close out by triggering their stops or, you know, just um, caused us to lose uh, lose mental support, right? So lose that ability, lose that willingness to step in continuously. So right now, all right, it's clearly what looks to be a retest of this major structural break. So if we go on to the higher time frame, all right, it's definitely, um, it looks like a bearish retest, right? So it looks like, for example, we are testing the lower portion of this structure, all right, and absolutely, that is a uh, opportunity for everyone to enter in a short was up here. Okay, uh, we already got our second test of this, but it's becoming um, it's becoming becoming quite a uh, quite a funny environment to trade because there's a lot of volatility, and the price action is um, I wouldn't say it's unpredictable because what's going on is is actually predictable. All right, so right now this looks like a great backside retest, right? So we've lost this range. And what I mean by backside is rather than, you know, you had a ton of opportunities up here to short, okay? Clearly after these two over here and this double top, all right, there's plenty of opportunities to short, whether you're shorting uh, the midpoint of this range, okay? Whether you're shorting on the break, all right? Whether you're shorting this backside retest, okay? After this breakdown, all right? Now it looks like, again, you have that same setup where, for example, we break below a key structural area and we have that first test. And obviously that is a sell initially, all right? So how this unfolds from here remains to be seen now, for a few reasons and the reasons why it's a little funny right now is because or rather why it, I would say that it's advisable not to just commit him initially is uh, what is going on in the last 48 you know 48 hours so this low over here 
Okay, this high over here and this over here, um, if you just sat on the sidelines and assumed what would happen, okay, you probably would have been right. So what happened after this over here? We had a pretty intense battle going on between bulls and bears, right? To put it to put it lightly, okay. You had uh, a lot of a lot of traders anticipating that we were going to retest. All right, uh, I'll put it on put the Clark indicator on right now to show you um, the monthly open. Okay, anticipating that we were going to retest. Turn this off. Okay, one second, bear with me. Whoops. Okay, anticipating that we we're going to be testing this line. All right, see if I could get uh, TradingView to behave, or rather myself to figure this out. Anticipating that we're going to be retesting this line. All right. Okay, which this is essentially the monthly open. So. Uh, I created this indicator. It just gives you basic stuff, right? It shows you when bears are in control, when bulls are in control, uh, as indicated by the 20 moving average. Uh, we have settings to show when the volume is above the volume moving average. Okay, we have um, ATR based channel support and resistance on this. But more importantly, you know, we have the monthly open that we indicate. So the anticipation was that a breakout of this range was going to test the monthly open. All right. Now, one thing that I always notice is that you don't need to see explicitly that. You know, traders on Twitter, for example, are bullish or bearish. You just have to see them talking about one thing enough to indicate that they're likely long. Okay, that they're likely in position. Okay, when they're when everyone is sharing their target that they think the market is going to move to next. All right, more often than not, you know, you don't get that. Okay, the the trades like that don't occur when everyone is aware of something. That is not typically what you're going to find ends up resulting. Okay, that move does not end up resulting at least as you intend it to. It might take. You know, it might take uh, the zig and a zag to get there rather than just go directly. All right, just to throw people off and to get people off sides. Okay, so what happened? We had this breakdown. All right, we had this breakdown over here. Okay, I was short and I got to tell you, I was initially not very confident um, because it wasn't a necessarily for me a high probability trade. And the fact was my target was so close by. Okay, so I closed out between 7,135 and 7,145 and for good reason. Okay, any type of any time that we get um, what is anticipated to be a large move in either direction, but it does not result in any type of follow through and we get some type of stalling. All right, not only do we get a stalling, but this area down here, okay, looked like bait. And what I mean by that is it looked like such an obvious short. All right, it looked like it was flagging. Okay, we had these lows right here. It looked like all we need to do is break these lows and price gives you that in, that um, that false feedback to where it starts poking through and you think that eventually it's just going to skip down. All right. And what does that incentivize you to do? It might incentivize you to just pull out a market order and immediately execute right into that cell. Now this looks obvious. Okay. It's everyone is about, everyone is able to look at the same thing that's occurring. Okay. So that's why I consider it bait. And when you look at the actual exo charts or something that shows you a footprint, you know, what do you see? Okay. You see, there's a lot of imbalances in this area. Okay, not only that, that in these candles that we see, okay, so the first candle, okay, there is uh, initially there's this negative delta, all right, so negative delta in this candle meaning there's a lot of aggressive market selling. Still, we have a green candle, so we have this absorption down here. We have all of this imbalance, all right, we have all of this volume at the bid on the bottom. So, what does that say? Okay, there's not a lot of volume down here, so this is a volume cluster, so not a lot of volume. What you can see is all of the volume that we do have down here, okay, is all selling volume. Okay, so it is all aggressive selling. Okay, so those are trap traders right there. Okay, so you have them in position. Okay, the imbalances, aggressive selling, okay, green candle bar. So right here, imbalances right here, obviously, on the first bill. All of the imbalances right here, green candle bar, negative delta, okay, more passive, rather more aggressive selling than buying, but still we have that passive limit order, okay, absorbing all that. All right, not just referring to one, but to referring to the wall. Okay, and then what do we see across the board here? Rather, as price unfolds through these following rotations, we see increasingly negative cumulative volume delta, not a tremendous change in actual price action. Okay, and then what we have is essentially we have more of these imbalances. Okay, more of the volume occurring at the lows. So you see, right, if you look over here, okay, if we just, I'm just going to put on the bid ask. All right, you could see the imbalance is right here, right? So what happens, obviously, everyone who was waiting to short this break got the break, 
all right? But again, got the break, aggressively sold, and we had, again, this candle move upward, right? So you have traders trapped here, traders trapped there. So what essentially it looks like is that sellers are trying to push this lower, but were unable to. So you had this divergence, all right, in cumulative volume delta, all right, between that passive order flow and that active order flow, or rather the passive, um, the passive entity here that was absorbing all that uh, was clearly the heavier hand. So what happened? You had to squeeze upward. Okay, that was a very obvious looking short setup. And again, the market doesn't reward you with a free lunch. And then after, what did we have? Okay, we had this major bullish move. Okay, so again, it was a short squeeze though. So mechanically speaking, we understood why this happened. So this is a short squeeze. All right, let me just take these candles off really quickly. I'll put on the, we'll just put on volume profile. So we have a short squeeze. All right, and you can see it's a short squeeze. You see all of these market executions moving upward. So what that means is essentially those are shorts covering, not a tremendous amount of volume here, but a ton of imbalances. Okay, you can imagine that people did market into this, but what do you see? Okay, you get to the top up here. You have traders market executing up here. This can be shorts covering, liquidation, so forth. All right, again though, what happens? All right, as we are moving up and forward, okay, buyers are aggressively buying. Okay, so for example, you have this red candle right here, okay, but it has a positive delta. You have active buyers essentially buying what they think is going to be the next part of a major breakout, okay, because we had what? A breakthrough market structure that was, you know, painted for just a few days, okay, so not a macro structure by any means, okay, so more often than not, traders give too much weight to something that is really just near term structure. So again, what happens? Okay, we saw over here, we saw aggressive long setting up, okay open interest increasing, but for these aggressive longs that we saw setting up, okay, we saw a tapering price action. So we have the CVD increasing, okay, long setting up, trap traders up here, and all that really takes at this point is a push in the opposite direction. So again, what did this look like, all right? If you're just looking at what is obvious setups, you're not gonna get rewarded, all right? Now, one of the things you should have spotted immediately was the fact that there was all of this wick Okay, this was all absorbed up here. All right, so this is not a bullish looking candle by any means. All right, so if you were looking at this thinking it was a flag, well, then you were overlooking a lot of other things and you were just, you know, fueling your bias, hoping that this would be the bottom move up. Okay, now this is a thinly traded market still. Okay, it is the largest cryptocurrency, or right? it has the most volume in terms of any other cryptocurrency. All right, but, um, you know, not, notwithstanding all that, there's still, it is still a thinly traded asset when traders are caught off sides. Um, substantially, we get these large moves. All right, we've seen this time and time again. All right, this is how the market moves a lot of the times and, and goes from one range to the next. So what happens? Sets up for the obvious, what looks like an obvious long, okay, because it clearly broke market structure, traps traders up here. Same thing occurs down here. And all that's really happening is this is a back and forth, okay, um, and it, it, what it is, it's people who are just impatient at this point. Okay, what can they do instead? Well, all they have to do at this point is, let me just reload this chart. All they have to do at this point and all what I, what I was doing um, until over here where I caught a quick short, um, was I essentially was just thinking, all right, I'm, I would rather stay off sides right now and let this energy kind of dissipate because that's all this is, all right? Because we go from one area that looks, okay, this has to be bullish, all right? So um, let me take these off again, they're bothering me. Um, so we can go from one area that looks like it has to be bullish Okay, so this move through structure over here, and I don't know why this is not loading my, one second, let me see if I could get this to work, template, new day, nope, not working, so I think I just lost all my drawing somehow. Anyway, so we get what looks like a breakdown, so it has to be bearish, all right, everyone sells this, squeeze upward, this has to be bullish, again, so what does this ultimately set up? Um, this ultimately sets up, I'll put this back, this ultimately sets up what is a complete rejection and retrace. So then clearly this has to be bearish, you know, so it's just, this is a, um, this becomes a joke at this point. So again, traders position themselves, okay, and uh, get short and we have a little bit of a squeeze again. All right, what I would do is I would just let this energy dissipate, okay, and I would define a wider zone to deal in. So if I'm looking right now at any point to enter in any type of longs, I'd rather deal over 7,800, okay? It's just the cost of doing business. I'd rather miss out on this at this point with all the chop that's going over, going on over here. And if I would be looking to enter into any type of short, well, I would say that uh, with that, I would actually be willing to enter in a little bit sooner because the overall energy right now is down, okay? So 
the overall energy is down right now. And I say, you know, don't try to, you know, hold back the tide with a broom. Um, so that being said, if there are moves downward, I think that traders are um, much more keen or rather quick to, at this point, sell the market than buy it. Okay, we do need some type of stabilization. And during the stabilization, I'm going to be looking for some key things to start showing up. Okay, I'm going to be looking for a period of stabilization where, say, for example, you know, um, if, if, say, I'm just going to define this chart again with the weekly swing points. So if we have this, all right, this was the macro point of control, these two areas. So, you know, just doing some crude artwork. Um, if I was looking at this, what I would want to see is us to potentially test this bottom again, start moving sideways. And then while we're moving sideways, I would ultimately want to see something like a, um, a considerable difference between uh, the futures and the spot price indicating that there is, you know, just think about something like um, negative funding. Okay, it's something to show that potentially shorts are already positioned and setting up. Okay, so whether or not you're looking at the premium index and there's that um, there's that discount between uh, spot and perp. Okay, so what I mean by that is there's a, a basis. So positive basis meaning that the, um, the spot is above the futures price. Um, so I'll be looking for that, uh, and that indicates that you know not only sentiment really negative, but positioning is already being set up in that regard. Uh, I'll also be looking for things like cumulative volume delta. Okay, so for example, I'll be looking at indications within that rather. So say for example, we are moving sideways, and this is if we get sideways movement, right? So this is conditionally or rather contingent on that. So if we're moving sideways, and I see that CVD is going increasingly into the red, or increasingly negative rather but price is not really changing much with regards to its range high, range low, or even point of control. Or rather say, let's say that it just spends a good amount of time between weekly value areas. So if I'm looking at um, something like the weekly chart uh, and I'm looking at value areas, so let me just zoom out. Okay, so still have a tenuous grasp on how to properly um, navigate this as fast as other people do. So let me just change the tick size. Okay, so what I'm looking at is uh, one, I would obviously want to see us reclaim this low over here, all right? Or if we're moving sideways, maintain some type of value area. And by that, I mean the value area being the area where a dominant portion of the trading volume took place per weekly bar. So if we get a, you know, we get a few weekly rotations. So say right here, say, see for example, right here, we have this value area. So if I hit this, you'll see it disappear. Okay, so the value area is where 68% of the trading volume took place. So if you think about standard one standard deviation and how it represents 68.8, okay, uh, percent of if you're just thinking about a balanced distribution. All right, think about this is where the dominant portion of trading volume took place. Okay, so within this rotation, this is the value area. So if we talk about the auction market theory, talk about um, value low, value high, how we auction between, you know, absorption and auction rather between those two points. Right, so when price comes down to the value area low, so when it's perceived as below value, you know buyers will bid it up, okay. And again, when it's perceived as above value, um, sellers will essentially um, will offer it down. So if we maintain some type of sideways price action in which we have negative cumulative volume delta, or rather in increasing, just consider it as increasing uh, aggressive order flow to the downside, but we're maintaining sideways structure, we're maintaining some type of value area within value areas. So we don't have any type of major close outside of a value area. And what I mean by that is if you want to look at this example, okay, see this candle right here? Here's the value area. The following candle, its value area and its close is through, right? So not only we're closing through this um, low and high, but we're out of this value area. Our value area is right now into this wick, and there's clearly downside momentum, okay? So the, the uh, sellers at this point are just offering it lower. So you get the point. I want to see sideways price action. I want to see that negative sentiment start to pick up though. Okay. And what that looks like to me then is at that point, okay, what that looks like to me, I finally found it again, is uh, it looks like there will be a position where we have potentially shorts to be caught off sides. Okay. Where they're positioning in anticipation of further downside, but all you really need to do. And if you're a larger trader with, you know, there is edge um, to be, to, be found in actually pushing the market and provoking it, even if it's going to cost you some by you provoking it with the use of market orders. So, um, you know, that's the cost of doing business sometimes, right? So you pay for that slippage to provoke that movement because you know, let's say, for example, um, let's say that we do paint some type of sideways structure. 
all right, you know that if we paint a sideways structure and here's your midpoint, uh, that we could pretty much just look at this at any point and say, okay, um, if I'm aggressive, I only have to push the market, you know, here to activate or rather liquidate any 50% 50 shorts, okay, 50 times rather, so uh, using 50 times leverage. And then I only have to push it up till 10%, to get into that area where we have people using 10 times leverage. So it becomes a, you know, not that, so to move the market 10%, you'd have to look at the book shape, for example, and see the depth of market, and that would cost a tremendous amount of money. But nevertheless, once you, all you have to do is really start getting these dominoes going. So with crypto, all you have to do is get the first, you know, the first large traders to be liquidated to cause that cascade to the upside and to the downside. Uh, and you'll hear me refer to how, um, so you, everyone knows by now that I have a traditional markets background. I started trading equity derivatives, um, got into trading crude primarily. Uh, and when you talk about uh, trading futures and trading commodities, for example, when you're trading, just think about trading futures, think about trading a MEX or Bybit or Deribit, um, your long is someone else's short. So everyone has a equal and opposite bet against them. Um, you know, you have different leverages and different position sizes and, you know, um, who you enter with and who you exit with isn't the same, but uh, there is a you know long for every short, a short for every long. So uh, the market moves up on fear the same way it moves down in traditional markets. And what that means is um, there's fear to both directions. Okay, uh, so for example, you know if the market moves up, there's fear because shorts are in position because they have to be in position, right? So for any long to open up, shorts have to be in position. Uh, and any type of short that is con that is in position as the market moves up is going to likely be underwater, um, depending on you know how much leverage you use, depending on their position size. You know it could be a little bit more painful than someone else, and you know when they have to consider or weigh closing out or whether or not they get liquidated. Okay, that fear, right? That's in um, all of those traders acting in unison cause crashes to the upside. So that's why they say, you know, commodities have a different skew um, than equities markets do if you're just thinking about uh, skews and options. So um, I definitely go off on a tangent, but uh, this, um, this has been a good part of my life, so I kind of love to talk about it. I think you could tell. So, um, so that's it. So I think uh, that's what I'm looking for right now. I have to tell you that I'm still, although I gave you that caveat about, you know, be prepared always, that's just a healthy reminder because, you know, the same way that I see traders incorrectly using funding is that they'll look at uh, the first sign of negative funding, the first sign of positive funding, okay? Um, keep in mind, funding can be negative for a while. It can be long for a while, okay? It doesn't mean that uh, the market has to turn once it goes negative or once it goes positive, okay? Keep in mind that funding is a basis point. So uh, if you have a million dollar position, okay, and funding is a tenth of a, per of a percent, all right, um, or a, a percent of a, of a percent, one percent of one percent, all right, that's a very small, small number, okay? And those numbers just came off the top of my head, but but if you're thinking about how that affects most traders, it doesn't, it's a negligible effect, all right? There is something to be said for reaping the reward of that and being the one who benefits from that um, because essentially that is, uh, that's just coming in like income. Um, you're just receiving that premium. Uh, but it's not really a decision that is going to um, weigh someone, uh, you know, influence someone maybe to close out their position per se. But what it is, is a useful metric or barometer to identify what side of the market already has been positioning themselves aggressively. So when there's a discount between, you know, uh, when there's a discount or a premium between spot and futures. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually brings me to another point. Uh, one of the things that I actually want to look for um, and uh, I think is a pretty good metric or pretty good thing to pay attention to when it comes to sentiment is actually the futures market, right? So um, not so much necessarily the CME, although I've discussed how the actual amount of money sometimes at play in the CME might be comparable to BitMEX. Uh, but the thing is, um, the initial margin that's required on the CME, so 37% to open up a position, whereas BitMEX, you know, your initial margin, you, you know, you could put down a dollar to trade bit on behalf of 100. So the notional value of contracts might be higher on BitMEX, um, but the amount of money at play might sometimes be more or less uh, pretty close, just put it that way. We know that there's, um, there probably is less trading, all right? It's safe to say that BitMEX leads the market. But um, nevertheless, looking at the CME futures quotes, okay, so we see the, uh, if you just look at this term structure, right, so from December all the way to March, uh, when I start to see that this goes into backwardation, so meaning 
uh, if we're looking at a futures curve, so if we're looking at the curve and we're saying that we are here, okay, um, let's just say spot is here, right? or rather we are here, let me just redo this. Okay, so here and then over the futures term structure, okay, the prices um, begin to decrease. So the few, the furthest one has the uh, has a lower value than the than the current, right? So we're talking about backwardation. This typically doesn't. Um, it's not really applicable in cryptos because there's no real concern of supply shock or shortage. Uh, you'd see this in something like crude. Um, the market is normally in contango. And you know things are normally in contango, and futures are normally trading at a premium because of something like cost of carry, interest, storage, all those costs to be factored in. Um, but you know traditionally, most markets will trade in a, in a state of contango. But when the markets, or rather Bitcoin, is in a state of backwardation, so the futures curve is in, or the futures term structure is in backwardation, uh, that's a good sentiment indicator because that's them saying that the future value they're not interested in buying the future; they're interested in selling the future. All right, so. Um, just to put it very simply, so if we're talking about, uh, if we look at BitMEX, so I have um, right here we have the, uh, what is this one? This is December contracts, and then right here we have March. So if you want to just look at this really quick, you look at the spot, 7,364. Okay, currently the PERP is trading at a discount to the spot, all right? But then we look at, you know, forward contracts, 7,393, okay, 7,511, all right, so these are still in contango. So at the bottom, when we see really bearish sentiment, all right, when everyone assumes that it can only get worse, we'll typically see this term structure flip and it'll go into backwardation, all right? And I do have to say as a caveat, typical means one sample. So um, we don't have too much to go off of in terms of sample size. And that's one of the things that is kind of a looming presence in, in regards to looking over any data with, uh, with regards to crypto. But nevertheless, this is um, a retail-driven market, and being that retail is not as savvy or as intelligent as maybe someone in a traditional market who would know not to completely just uh, allow something to more or less crap the bed and, and sell something indefinitely. We have people that are, I think, trading on more emotions in crypto, um, and therefore uh, the decisions that they make are probably going to be reflected um, in ways that you might not necessarily have the luxury of seeing in traditional markets or acting on, and that alpha might not necessarily be as readily available or as obvious. So uh, that's what I'm going to be looking for. So looking at just the term structure, okay, so right now it's in contango. So if you look at the CME right now, it's so thinly traded that they're all so close regardless, okay? But uh, if we're looking at BitMEX, all right, when we're talking about not just short term, right? So not just during a dump, but if we see some state of continued period of backwardation or backwardation, um, that would be a really good, uh, that would be a really good point for me to consider allocating more towards spot holdings, right? Um, still with consideration that this thing can just go to zero, right? But if I want to enter in at certain points, I want to value average in, I want to get in at areas or at intervals that I think are, um, not just um, governed by how much time passes or how much price drops, but rather um, times when I think are uh, times to be buying blood, right? Quote, unquote. So I think that pretty much covers it. Um, lastly, I'll just talk about the most recent Bitcoin transaction. Everyone has mentioned that. Um, I would say that with regards to any kind of outside news, any type of um, things that are not very easily verifiable, Okay, there is often a um, there is a tendency to take information and run with it on Twitter, interpret it poorly or interpret it to fit your bias. Um, and I think that you know it, empirically it stands to say it stands up that um, the more information you have, the more confident you'll feel. But the actual the, the actual um, the, the more information you have, you'll feel you'll feel more confident. But you actually make um, you'll make poorer decisions, all right? So put it that way, you'll be less effective, all right? That's, it took me a while to get that out. I sounded like um, uh, Tropic Thunder. Um, or is it Tropic Thunder or is it, oh my God, it's a Spike Lee movie and he says, ma 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 Malcolm. Um, oh, what is it called? What is that movie called? Oh no, I'm gonna forget it and it's an old movie. You guys probably wouldn't know anyway. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so yes, so things like that, I try to not pay too much attention to, attention to. I just try to pay attention to what is um, taking place in price and volume. All right, 
Um, so at the bottom here right now on a macro scale, there's a lot of absorption. All right, there's a lot of aggressive selling. Okay, you can see that in this candle right here, all right, this is a weekly candle. Okay, this is um, 766 million contracts sold. All right, um, rather, you know, this is just, this right here is the negative delta, what I was talking about. I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, this is cum for this, but this is, uh, this is a lot of aggressive selling. Okay, someone was on the other side of that trade. So someone had to take the other side of that trade, right? Um, you know, after a major move down like this, what are you going to get in? You're going to get in some type of volatility suppression in the form of mean reversion traders who are looking to buy, you know, anything that is uh, more than, you know, two standard deviation move, for example, and they're expecting some type of bounce back. There is, um, there is uh, trading, you know, systems that they use that in traditional markets and they have a decent sharp ratio just from something like that. Well, they'll sell, you know, four down days in the, on the S&P and it, you know, has it has a positive expectancy or a sharp ratio of like 1.2 or something. Um, so uh, you'll get people that are stepping in. Obviously, someone's going to take the other side of that trade. It doesn't mean it's going to maintain, but nevertheless, we are starting to see a lot of absorption. We're starting to see a lot of that negativity. It doesn't mean we're not going to get another move down, but I just say keep that in mind. All right, pay attention to the omens, as I've mentioned. So I think that is that. I think I covered a lot of stuff. Um, I will have to say as a caveat moving forward, I think I've used the word caveat four times. That's not good. Um, so if we test this area again, I don't think that is a good short opportunity. Uh, I'm just, you know, you test an area multiple times and then it becomes such an obvious short opportunity to everybody else. Again, if I put on the Clark indicator and we just put on the monthly open, uh, the monthly open right here, Okay, this line, which is at 7,551. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about this being a great short opportunity. Okay, 7,551 is right here. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a great idea, okay, because at this point, uh, we are potentially uh, establishing what looks to be a, you know, it's clearly a uh, higher low, all right. Um, you know, it hasn't, it remains to be seen, obviously, but. When you have enough traders that are looking at this and not acting necessarily on it right away, all right, you start to get that bullish brewing that's going on under the surface. And at this point, anyone who's going to sell what is an obvious retest for the third time, all right, or the second, the, I think it would be the third time at this point, one, two. Yeah, essentially, you're just testing these highs for the third time. Uh, the obvious trade, again, doesn't reward you. So there is an edge to just this pushing through. And we saw that occur. All right, if you're watching um, a candle move up through an area that was once heavily contested, so like this over here, we're, we're paying attention to this. Um, there was a ton of battling, a ton of fighting that took place between these rotations, right? Now, if we saw that taking place and then it finally broke down and we see a move that starts to push through it and it gets no resistance whatsoever, um, you could pretty much say with a decent amount of confidence that this is going to be a squeeze that blasts through. So if you see no wick and you're almost halfway through, might be um, there might be a reason to market buy into that uh, with a tight stop, right? So that's that, guys. Okay, pay attention. Um, right now, I wouldn't advise you know getting involved in the lower time frames. I'd wait for more key areas. Okay, and what I mean by that is again, if I'm looking for longs. All right, what's the what's the pain in waiting for 7,800, okay? All right, above here, retest there, okay? And everyone's probably gonna be on board, and at that point, I'd say you probably at least test this high, okay? Uh, if you're looking for shorts, all right, I'd say that the opportunity might come, a, it, it, I'd say that there's a little bit more certain in, certainty in the opportunity, okay, in that if we lose this low at this point, all right, uh, that would be a pretty bad sign, okay? I lose this low, retest. Uh, might be a good short opportunity for at least this low, all right, um, with expectation that we'd probably be testing this low again. But uh, as always, guys, you know, if you're ever extremely comfortable taking a trade, it might not be a good trade, all right? It's um, the market does not reward, um, it does not reward in that fashion. It baits, it baits in that fashion. So that's that, guys. If you have any questions, uh, I'm going to start doing more of these videos. Josh does videos, I'm going to be doing videos. Um, my background is in trading and in markets, and uh, I want to be able to be a great source of information and knowledge for you guys. Uh, so feel free to, to send questions my way as well. So um, hit me up on Twitter, Kenner and Clark. Um, you know, take a look at Block Roots. Okay, uh, we offer I, it's a one of a kind 
educational platform and there's no other platform or group out there right now that is doing anything that is even remotely comparable. I say that with absolute confidence, not being cocky. Um, I've had very, you know, very um, obvious public success in the last three months in the market. Um, and it's just because I call things as I see them. I remain as, as objective or clinically objective as possible. Uh, and I try to um, give that to our members, all right, our guests on Block Roots, um, and we provide a comprehensive education. Uh, it's not a signal service by any means. You know, we talk about the trades that are setting up, but we're not just you know s sending you uh, charts with enter here, exit here. All right, you're going to learn about all the things that go into observing price action, order flow, um, heavy, heavy on the order flow because that's what my background is in. Um, and yeah, that's that. So take a peek. All right, it's been a pleasure. This is Ryan, also known as Kenner and Clark, exercise proper risk management and trade effectively.